Today I have the pleasure of being with an old friend, not that we're old, but old friendship, uh, Jim Good, uh, who has been living in Hawaii for many, many years. And uh, we've been reminiscing, especially about our involvement in the resistance against the war in Vietnam. And also we share our, some experiences of uh, living and working here in Nicaragua. So Jim, if you could tell us a little bit about the process of conscientization, you know, consciousness raising, how you began to have a critical con uh, consciousness regarding the war, and then some of the first steps that you took to uh, get involved in resistance or opposition in some way? Probably after I graduated from Loyola University, I went to the Peace Corps. And I, like a lot of people of that period, respected my country and my sure. church. And the Dominican Republic uh, had gone through some convulsions in their country. The, uh, the dictator of 30-some years was assassinated. Uh, it seemed like there was going to be a bit of reprieve, that that didn't last long. The United U.S. Uh, military intervened in 1965. I arrived in 1968 as a Peace Corps volunteer without much understanding of where our country and the church that I was very much a part of, uh, uh, what the role, their role was. So it was a, a shock and an education to realize that my country and my church were not the institutions that I had perceived them and believed they were. In 1965, the U.S. invaded the Dominican Republic in order to prevent the return of Juan Bosch, who had been elected president in 1962, served as president in 1963, and was ousted by a coup in that same year. Public violence flared, endangering the security of the hemisphere. The Marines were sent in. That was clear. The socialism side was true. I mean, he was not a Marxist or a communist. But he was a socialist. He believed in that government and, and capital should work for the, for the greater good. So that was the beginning of my change of, or, or learning process. Uh, and the, the experience in the DR in the Dominican Republic was eye-opening. It was, I loved the DR. Um, I was shocked at the repression, the fear among the people. And uh, it was just kind of a personal revolt. And I have to admit, I think I was a bit cocky. Um, as, as an American, you carry more weight than certainly a, a Dominican my age, it was a real sense of, of, wait a minute, what are we doing here? What am I doing here if I just sit back and accept the role of the U.S. government? Uh, and so it wasn't long before Jaime Bueno 
was not tan bueno, uh, at least in the eyes of the Peace Corps, uh, the embassy. And uh, I continued to be outraged and to speak out against the atrocities. So that was the foundation of my of my uh, growing resistance toward the Vietnam. And I had just before I went to the Peace Corps, my my one of my younger brothers was killed in Vietnam, and I, like the rest of my family, just accepted that as the price of our freedom, and was outraged as I grew more to realize, no, he was a pawn, uh, a victim of uh, of the war as much as he was a soldier participating in it. He had no idea. You know, we grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania. He went through high school, was drafted right after high school at age 18. And at age 19, he was gone. And uh, all those things weighed heavily on myself and my family. And uh, so the the resistance to the war in Vietnam was a a natural step for myself and my family. I had a younger brother who was also in the seminary, and both of us became uh, active in the re- anti-war resistance. What was it about U.S. policy and U.S. history in the Dominican Republic that you found to be unjust and that uh, caused you to start thinking in a different way about uh, U.S. history in Latin America? Yeah, well, the DR... Uh, like most other Latin American countries suffered and I suppose continues to suffer from a a significant level of poverty, which poverty that certainly as a young American in a middle class uh, area of Pennsylvania, we were not used to. There was a lot of repression, killings, uh, violence, uh, and the poverty was something that was horrendous for me to have to to live with. Uh, And I I just kind of knee-jerked, reacted to it. And uh, and so I was not the volunteer that the American Peace Corps and the embassy expected. And it was just my reaction to the reality around me that... uh, And I wasn't the only one, but I was certainly one of the principal voices for resistance to U.S. policy while we were in the Peace Corps. So there were demonstrations in in Santo Domingo. The U.S. Peace Corps volunteers uh, participated in it against the wishes of the U.S. Embassy. And it was just a growing process uh, for myself uh, in those formative years. Were you there at the time of the U.S. invasion in 1965? No, no, I got there in 1968. Okay. But the ramifications of the invasion Mm -hmm. were very significant, and there was a lot of anger, particularly among the younger Dominicans. Uh, uh, It squelched their desire for more freedom and and more justice in the U.S., uh, came in once again on the wrong side. So that was the beginning. I think it started there, the Peace Corps people in resistance, or there was an organization of former Peace Corps volunteers after they finished their terms of service who became very critical of U.S. policy. Yes, yes. Both in the country and afterward. Uh Yeah. Okay, so that uh, you started thinking about U.S. policy, foreign policy in a different way. And then the Vietnam War started heating up, and you became more concerned about that. Yeah, you know, when my brother died, I still didn't quite understand what was going on and kind of accepted his death as just the realities of war. And, of course, it was very angering later when you realize that he, like everybody, uh, the soldiers, they were were really victims and pawns in the war. Um it was hard to imagine the number 
of Vietnamese people that were being killed by U.S. presence there. And so there was a fairly strong contingent of Peace Corps volunteers in the DR who marched publicly against the war and uh, against the U.S. embassies, uh, the, the U.S. being, the embassy being the, the face of that. And, uh, so yeah, it was a great, great beginning of, of re a realization of not the world wasn't like I thought it was. Mm -hmm. So then you returned to the U.S. and became more involved in uh, analyzing the war in Vietnam and figuring out what you should do to oppose it? Uh, boy, that uh, seems like it was so many years ago. It's, uh, the beginning of it, how it all started, mm -hmm. is not real, real clear but um, in my, my memory, which is fading quickly. <laughs> uh, but... Yeah, coming back uh, to the United States, uh, the the war resisters were a growing number, and uh, I got involved. Uh, draft board resistant the movement because people were you know the draft boards were the first step for people to be drafted, and we thought it was more symbolic in the beginning, but actually as we continued our activities against the draft boards, we realized that it wasn't just symbolic, that uh, we were making it difficult for the draft boards to function and pick who was to go to Vietnam. and uh, So it, it was a, an interesting and challenging and exciting, I have to admit, you know, uh, attempt to slow down the process of the Vietnam War. We mutated a bit from get in, from standbys to get and split. We were realizing we were losing too many people standing by and then going to trial and the time and effort. So at some point along the way, we discovered that if we, we could be more effective by going in uh, off hours into the draft boards, removing thousands and thousands of records so that it made it more difficult for the draft boards to, to function normally. And, you know, so you take the draft boards from the draft records from one area and they just grabbed them from another, but we did whatever we could to foul up the the process of sending our, our young men. At that time, there weren't any women involved, but the, you know, our, our young men to either kill or be killed in a country that we knew absolutely nothing about. And and as we would have our discussions with sympathizers back on the mainland. One of my first questions would be, "Have you ever met a Vietnamese?" And it was so. My, one of my uh, my first involvements with the active community in resistance, uh, we lined up an interview with Dr. Curtis Tarr, who was the director of the of the Selective Service, uh, the draft system. And we went into his office. He ended up being uh, about 6'6", six, six, giant man. And we went in with the intention of asking him to close down the, the selective service system until a clearer understanding of what we were doing in Vietnam could be established. Of course, that didn't fly very well. And uh, we uh, had these cheap hidden under our shirts were cheap handcuffs. And our, it was a symbolic gesture, of course, to arrest him as part of start, trying to slow down the entire system of, of drafting people. And Dr. Curtis Tarr was like 6'6". And he, so one of our companions, uh, Jim Martin, who's 
relatively short guy, when reached for his arm and he just smacked him. And there's a famous picture of Jim falling backwards, his feet in the air, and Dr. Tarr's arm smacking him in the head. A uh, great photograph. It went national. So that began our march towards uh, the draft board resistance. And we discovered it was better to go in at nighttime, s surveil how to do that. And the more you do it, the better you become at it. Uh, to go in and remove as many draft boards, as many draft records as possible to make it more and more difficult for the easy flow of our young boys being sent to a war that we had no right to be, to be uh, uh, conducting. And so then we, we uh, went up to, I believe we went up to Buffalo, New York, where we had a connection and began our march. Uh, uh, we, we, we learned through experience the techniques of getting into offices at night. Uh, we weren't interested in destroying anything except the paper that was processing young boys to, to go and fight in a war that there was no justification for and we became better and better at it and uh i couldn't tell you how many draft boards we raided so you know i remember one time in in buffalo new york area we had three draft board raids in one night so then you you were mentioning the action in buffalo <clears throat> and you mentioned that your brother was involved in the camden 28 action in camden new jersey if you could uh, fill us in a little bit on that Uh, so we made an effort not to communicate among groups so that if something went wrong in one group, the other group wouldn't be harmed. Uh, my brother was doing surveillance for the Camden, at the Camden Federal Building with one of the other activists who ended up being a, uh, unbeknownst to us, of course, a provocateur on behalf of the FBI. Uh, and my brother happened to mention while they were surveying the building that maybe something, maybe some members of our group were preparing some actions in Buffalo, New York. So with that little tidbit of information, uh, the, the uh, person Bob, my brother was with, excused himself and went, called the FBI and said, something might be going on in Buffalo. Well, by then we had already been in the, F, the uh, federal building in Buffalo, had successfully entered the Army Intelligence Office. And as it turned out, there wasn't much really available for us to remove, but we just wanted to let them know we were there. And as we were about to move on to the uh, three draft boards that were also in the Buffalo Federal Building, um, the FBI showed up, really unprepared. They were out at a party. And so they came in in shorts and, and slippers. And all of a sudden, they encountered some members of our group. And... Uh, I had been in the weekend before to find a way out, and we found a, a really easy way out. And uh, so there were seven of us in the building, in the Buffalo Ra Buffalo Federal Building, and I was able to move fast, far enough away that I was able to get out of the building, along with one other young guy in our group. So there were just the two of us. Five people got left behind in the federal building with a few members of the FBI uh, uh, t 
taking cu- taking custody of them. So obviously the FBI had had surprised all of you and uh, put said you're under arrest to the to people who were there. Yeah, yeah. But you had before that you and this young fellow had gotten far out. enough away. We could hear them coming, uh-huh. and we heard him say, "Stop, you son uh-huh. of a bitch, uh-huh. or I'll blow your head off." And I realized, well, we were out of sight. But uh, anyway, we managed to get out. Okay. So, you know, uh, we ended up with the five of them being arrested and myself and my buddy Mike uh, got got away. Mm-hmm. And so I, I knew that my brother was, was, gonna, was arrested. And I, I uh, felt obligated to go to my parents' home, which was about four hours from Buffalo. Hitchhiking, of course, in those days was our mode of transportation. So I got down to my parents' house, and they were aware that Bobby had been arrested. And I went in and asked my parents for their support. I said, you know, I know in the next week or so you're going to have FBI agents here press here, and we want to know if we can depend on your support. And my parents were both fairly conservative. My mother, a conservative Catholic, but my dad particularly was a man of great strength and, and honor. And he said, no, we will support you. Mm-hmm. And uh, sure enough, a, a, a little later, the FBI showed up and my dad went to the door and they identified themselves, and they said, I wonder if either your son, Robert, or James, or preferably both of them might be available to speak to us. And he looked at the FBI, and he said, I know my sons, and I know that neither of them would have anything to say to you. Good day. <laughs> and I was so proud of that, because that was not my image of my father, hmm. on the one hand. Uh, but on the other, I said, that's him through and through, standing up. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, it was, a, it was a lesson for them. So that was the beginning of their, their total support. My mother ended up testifying at, at Bobby's trial in Camden, New Jersey, talked about her losing her one son in Vietnam, and... Uh, uh, played a significant role in getting the jury to acquit them just from her laying out the our background, where we came from. There was no malice. There was no deceit. There was no attempt to destroy, but attempt to to stop a, a horrible war that was going on. And uh, the jury later on said that my mother's testimony was significant mm-hmm. in them uh Giving an acquittal to the twenty-eight def- or the eighteen defendants on trial. Oh. These were simultaneous. The action in Camden, which was stopped by the arrival of the FBI in the building, and the action in Buffalo, where the FBI came in. Those were simultaneous. The same night. We had no idea. It was totally unprepared. It turned yes. out that way. It just turned out that way. Oh. The Camden group uh, was a much larger group. It had been planning their action for a considerable amount of time and uh, and uh, the, the the catholic priest uh, and and the canon group brought in a friend of his who was a convert to catholicism uh and he he had offered all kind of help because he was a, a technician that had access to materials and offered to help out of course unbeknownst that he had already gone to the FBI At the trial, one of the lawyers requested this material to be brought in, and it was quite amazing. In, in the courtroom itself, this significant amount of, of material, both personal and, and material that was collected for use in the, the uh, blotched uh, attempted raid on the draft board, uh, it was interesting to see how the 
material that the FBI had supplied via Bob Hardy grew. Uh, you know, expensive walkie-talkies and things that, that Bob said, oh, I happen to have these, or I got a good deal on these. And, of course, they were all being given to him to give to the group by, by the FBI. And the minimal contributions of the, the defendants themselves. And I think all those things made it pretty clear to the jury that the FBI played a significant role in bringing that action about. My mom's uh, testimony was critical. Well, I don't know. The, the, the defense uh, said, later on said it was very critical. She uh, took the stand as a, as a character witness for my brother, uh, described, you know, our family background. Uh, my dad was a carpenter. She a homemaker. Bobby and I were two of ten kids. You know, and struggled to to make it work. Her, she talked about how how they tried to instill, a, a, you know, positive uh, principles at us and for us, an example. And the end result was her testimony of of her losing her son, and and the, it brought a change of heart. In, in her her way of thinking, I remember her saying uh, uh, to the uh, as a witness that there was hardly a person within a fifty mile radius of where we were raised that were more anti communist than her. But then, of course, and the trial was a great education for all of us, including her. She realized how much uh, the the truth was not being told very clearly and accurately, or not at all, and she changed her mind and, and, and spoke very strongly against the war that had taken her son's life and was now threatening the freedom of another son. And uh, yeah, it was, it was great testimony on, on her behalf. And all those things worked for uh, the acquittal, 